Hi, this is Stuart again. This time we're going to show you how to take an ASP.NET Core web API project, do some nice enrichments to it, including customizing where we're going to put the port, setting up a global error handler, and also uh, we're going to Dockerize it, run it locally in Docker, and then we are going to go ahead and deploy it to our Azure Kubernetes instance. So let's get started. Here's the main entry point. We created this project, by the way, with .NET new web API. Uh, and then we went ahead and added our uh, packages to it. Make sure that you always do this using .NET add package. Uh, to make sure that it properly gets configured inside our .NET Core project. Once we had our working API the way we wanted it, we also created uh, it for Docker by installing the Visual Studio 2017 Docker for Windows extensions, which created a number of files for us that we'll show off in a few minutes. And then lastly, uh, we deploy it and run it locally, and then we deploy it and run it in AKS up in Azure. Okay, couple of tiny changes to the default startup behavior. Uh, obviously the main entry point is main. It calls build web host, which we implement ourselves. And the one line that I changed was use Kestrel and told it that I wanted to bind any IP address, which is the default right there. And then I said I wanted it to run on port 5000. Throughout the demo, we're going to have it run on port 5000. The next thing we need to do is make some changes in startup to support, among other things, uh, our desired configuration and error handling. So the first thing is configure services, where we told it to uh, add MVC, and then we t injected our filter of global exception filter. And that's going to handle all of the global exceptions within our app. So let's go look at it. So here is a pretty standard global exception. And um, here's a nice reference to someone who had a nice example. So we're going to create a global exception filter. And we're going to inject the logger into it. That's pretty much the default signature. But the meat of it is on exception, where we're going to get an exception context when an unhandled exception is thrown. And we're going to uh, build up a response that uses the response code that we want for each kind of exception. So in this case, I have a number of argument exceptions that my methods could throw, and they're all going to return a bad request, 400. And then for a not found exception, when someone's asking for a record by key, we're going to throw a key not found exception, and it's going to return a 404 of not found, and everything else is going to get a 500. So notice here we're using the very clever type switch, and you can pull the source code and look at typeswitch.cs, which was a open source contribution, which I thought was pretty cool. And you can see how much it cleans up our error handling because now we don't have to have a big ugly set of if blocks. We can use a type switch and case statements and pretty much structure what we want. We then build an error payload and we uh, respond by uh, turning that payload into a JSON object and sending it back to the client. Now, obviously you may want to change this behavior depending on whether you're in development or production, but in most cases there's something that you could do that's similar. So nice global exception handler, very, very compact and following our best practice of not trying to handle individual exceptions inside our const our controller methods, but instead using a global exception filter so that we're returning a, a rich, re consistent return every single time we have an exception. Okay, the next thing that we need to do is we need to set up our Swagger documents. And I've chosen to use uh, our XML code comments as well. Again, this is a best practice. I'm going to configure that, by the way, by going into properties going into build. And if we scroll down, you can see we set the XML documentation file, the customer API.xml. And you can see that here, 
And then one more nuanced detail is you want to make sure that you always copy that to the output directory. Parenthetically, to make random customers for our demo without needing to deploy a little database, I'm using the incredibly handy faker.data, which I ported to NetCore. And so it has a data file called fakerdata.xml, and it too should be copied always to the output. So now that we've done that, we can go back and look at our startup. So we want to add our Swagger uh, generation. Now we could just say add Swagger gen and not really add a bunch of stuff, but I wanted to show you that in fact, the constructor for it is actually very rich. And if you have an info object, you can add all sorts of handy things. Here we embed a nice title, version, contact information, license information, and so on. And we'll show you what this looks like in a sec. This is critically important as it must match the path we're going to use later. And in this case, instead of the traditional V1, I'm using a numbered uh, version instead. By the way, this matches the uh, release in GitHub. So as I make new releases in GitHub prior to doing that, I version my uh, DLL version and I also version my Swagger. Down here we say include XML comments. And so in order to do that, we have to compute where that is. And here's the formula for doing that. Notice that this is slightly different than it would be in .NET CLR. We also need to have our configuration app builder. And so is development test with our developer X, uh, page. And then we can have use Swagger and then we can configure our Swagger UI to have some additional properties. Again, these are nice to have, so they're not necessarily required. One thing that is super critical though, is that that matches that version string up above. And you can see that I've asked it to also show the request headers and show a little JSON editor uh, in my Swagger pages. Other than that, the only thing that's really interesting, of course, is our controllers. Let's go look at those. And you can see that I have lushly commented my controllers with XML comments, including the errors I expect them to throw. Notice the attribute here has changed in .NET Core. Uh, produces response type is what's used instead. And so this is the happy path we're going to get a type of models.person for this method, which gets by ID. Notice that in my, my body, I don't have to do anything more than just throw whatever exceptions I've wired into my global error handling, and the global error handler will translate these things into the correct response. So let's go ahead and run this in Visual Studio. And there you go, a gorgeous swagger page. Notice that we have our customizations up above. So we have our description. We have who it was created by. It makes a contact the developer link. It makes a link to uh, where my GitHub home site is. It even has a little link to the MIT license. And then you can see if we expand the operations that we get this beautiful Swagger UI. Notice that it picked up our XML code comments so it picked up what response messages were potentially available and it lovingly called out what my returns were going to look like. So we'll go ahead and invoke this. Let's search for uh, EA. And you can see that I got a response body with some matches in where first name, last name e or email had uh, EA in it, and I can take one of these IDs, and I can go up to my uh, upper method that does a search by ID, and go ahead and invoke it, and there is the ID for the record that I pulled up. So, beautiful working Swagger API with fantastic documentation, uh, because we spent the extra effort. And we'll open up the Docker file. So part of this was generated by Visual Studio add-ons for Docker, but I'm a big fan of also adding some enrichments or embellishments to these. Uh, if you watched my last video on doing this with Node.js, uh, you pretty much know what's coming. So from 
is the Linux version of ASP.NET Core. Notice we specified version two. We add some labels, uh, which is a good practice. We have some environment variables. For example, we configured uh, port as 5000 and the working directory as WAC app. We have an arg of source. And so we will run make dir slash p, which says if the directory doesn't exist, it's going to make it. We're going to set the work dir to our wdir variable slash app. So all of the subsequent commands are going to be relative to that folder. And now all we have to do is copy up all the app source. And so when we do a build, it's going to end up in the OBJ folder in a subfolder called Docker, publish. So this is the folder that's going to get deployed. So we want all of that stuff published to dot, which is in this case, the working directory. Again, best practice, it's nice to make sure that the files we expect to be there are there. It helps when you're building the container as a way of visually just checking to make sure all the files get where we think they ought to go. We're gonna expose port 5000. We're gonna set up a simple health check on port 5000. And then we're gonna tell it how to start. Notice this is slightly different from Node in that we specify an entry point instead where we tell it to .NET customer API .dll. And that's going to be this DLL right here that was generated from Docker. So let's go ahead and build this from the command line just by way of example. So I always build myself uh, a couple of scripts, one called buildsha, and buildsha has the correct command lines that will build and push my container. So notice that we're specifying that object docker publish folder and we're giving it a set of instructions, right? We're restoring our packages, we're doing a publish on our customer solution in release mode, and then we do a docker build to build our docker container and then we push it. So this is building our source, then we're building our container and then we're pushing our container to the repository. Let's go ahead and run this. By the way, this thing where it says it can't find Microsoft.docker.sdk can is a known bug and can safely be ignored. And you can see we verified that all our files are coming out and we're preparing to push our images. There we go. So we built it and we've pushed our newest image customer API to our repository. So just like I have a file that is used to build, I like to make one to run it locally. So again, I specify what the name of my repository and image is, and then I tell it to run it in the background, mapping the port 5000 in the container to the port uh, 5000 on my local machine, and I give it a name of customer API, which will make it easier to do later. And then I tell it to start localhost 5000 Swagger, so it brings up my Swagger page. So let's go ahead and run local and watch what happens. And there you go, there's our Swagger. So if we flip back to the command line and do a Docker PS, you can see we actually have two running. The first one is the one that we told it to run from our run local command. And the second is the one that is, uh, was initiated by Visual Studio. If I want to kill either one of these things, or both, I can say docker kill and go get our short form container ID. We'll use space as the delimiter. And now if we do a docker ps, both are stopped. So to deploy it on AKS, we have to use kube control. So the first thing we're gonna do is deploy a deployment. Let's, so let's go look at our deployment file. Here's the deployment YAML. Um, we give it a name, customer API hyphen deployment. Again, it's a good practice to hyphenate the deployment with deployment to disambiguate it from the service. And we tell it what image we want to pull and from where, and we tell it that we want it to expose port 5000. Let's take a look at the service YAML as well. From the deployment customer API, on 
we want to expose port 5000 on our load balancer. So let's go ahead and deploy this out to Kubernetes. So first we'll create our deployment and then we'll create our service. Now let's go ahead and invoke kube control proxy and go look at our graphical Kubernetes dashboard. And again, here we specify UI. If you don't, you get a list of all of the available endpoints. But slash UI brings us up our beautiful user interface. And you can see if we scroll down to services that in fact we have a nice customer API service running. Let's go over to our Azure page and look at our agent pool machine. And let's copy our public IP address and paste it and go to 5000 and go to Swagger. Hey, our patience has been rewarded. There is our ASP.NET Core Web API running up in AKS. Let's tear this all down because we don't need it anymore. That's pretty straightforward. We'll go ahead and stop the proxy and then we'll say kube control delete service we want to do things in the opposite that we deployed them so our service was created last so it is deleted first and then we want to delete our deployment and of course we name that as a best practice with a hyphen deployment so we have to make sure we supply that when we delete it and it's gone